Steve, uh, by going remote now, uh, we, we are maximizing our in-person learning. Uh, we have two in-person days next week, Monday and Tuesday. Then we have Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday that is our Thanksgiving break. Then the week after that, the week of November 30th, we would stay in a red status level uh, just to allow for all of our current quarantines to expire. Uh, would also give us some time in case there are any flare-ups over the Thanksgiving break. Uh, from Thanksgiving Day until December 7th is a 10-day window uh, where you know any potential flare-ups, we would be able to see those coming and, and account for those. And then hopefully we'll be back in session December 7th. That would give us two weeks before we then break for Christmas uh, and the Christmas holiday break. And then we're back, uh, you know, separated from each other for a couple of weeks and then back at it in early January. Uh, so that's, that's the plan as of right now. Also over the next three days, I will utilize that time to uh, inform our community of a, a number of uh, different items that, that we need to address. Things like food services, uh, extracurricular activities, uh, the daily schedule for students. Uh, we'll update our remote learning plan and send that out. Uh, so we'll utilize uh, the next three days to send emails to our families, utilizing our messaging system with details on how those things are gonna operate. For example, our food services. In the spring, if you remember, we had food pickup every Sunday. Uh, beginning Monday, November 23rd, we'll transition to utilizing our drivers and our building aids, and we will deliver meals on our bus routes. Uh, so we'll have our buses out every single day, uh, the 23rd, 24th, and then the week of November 30th, and our buses will drive their normal routes and stop at the bus route, bus stops, and uh, just somebody from the family would need to be there to, to pick up the meal for the day. We'd have a, a lunch and breakfast for the next morning, and then the next day the bus will be back with another drop off. So uh, we want to get that type of information out to our community and that gives us the next three days to uh, distribute that information as well to make sure that uh, you know we can answer questions and, and give people time to prepare and adjust. Uh, so uh, wanted to uh, get that out to the board. I, I didn't want to send that phone message out too late this evening, uh, but I wanted to talk to the board prior to that message going out to our community. So uh, it's the main reason for moving the superintendent updates for the first thing. Uh, we, you know, Friday I sent a message out and we had every intention of waiting until Wednesday to do a status update. Uh, I have a meeting with the Fairfield and Franklin County Health Departments tomorrow. We're also expecting to get some information from the Ohio High School Athletic Association tomorrow. Um, and uh, then anticipating additional information coming from Governor DeWine on Wednesday. So we, we were hoping to make it till then, but uh, the last 24 to 36 hours, uh, Sunday and then into Monday morning, uh, we're just, we're to the point where we have so many students quarantined that it really is uh, prohibiting effective education from taking place. So part of us moving to a red status level is out of an abundance of caution. Uh, we want to do all we can to try to curb the increase in numbers that we're seeing in our community. Uh, we also want to uh, allow for students that are in quarantine uh, to not kind of be in limbo. They're not in VLA, but they're not in the classroom. Uh, so uh, in all honesty, I think we're well over 200 students in quarantine K through 12, uh, which is 10% of our student body. Uh, so it's just gotten to the point that uh, I believe it's the best course of action to put all students in the same learning environment uh, so our teachers can be more effective in delivering education. Um, and we know the quarantine period is typically 14 days. Uh, so that's kind of the time frame I chose uh, to bias, bias some of that time, get our staff members back, get our students back. Uh, and uh, I will uh, look to send out an update on Wednesday, December 2nd uh, to inform our community, are we still on track to come back December 7th? 
how are the numbers looking. Uh, I'll continue to have my weekly meetings with the health department as well as uh, we have a meeting, I believe it's December 3rd with the COVID defense team for Fairfield County. Uh, so I'll be hearing from uh, county health care officials during that meeting as well. So um, that, that's, that's where we're at right now. Uh, uh, you, we tried to avoid this as long as possible. Uh, our staff's done an amazing job. Our community has been second to none. The support from our parents has been just amazing. Uh, we have fought a good fight, uh, but, but I believe we are at that point now that education is suffering. So uh, would uh, would recommend that we go ahead and make that move. So <clears throat> love to hear any thoughts, feedback, if you have any. <clears throat> and Mr. Calvella, as you mentioned, we're in the center of our uh, students not, not enrolled in virtual learning or in the classroom, you know, they're suffering. You know, yeah. So um, no doubt about it, they're going to be able to pick up some education now that, uh, that they'll be received. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? I think, like you said, we're at that point. We saw them biking, probably going to come down to this, but while the district does it, try to stay in session. So, hopefully, we can back at number seven. <clears throat> um, and part of uh, kind of the timing of things, I wanted to get the message out tonight, really to give parents and teachers time. Uh, the, the second part of that is, I don't want to make calls on things like extracurriculars, uh, our, our sports, youth leagues, uh, until we're able to gain more information tomorrow with those health department meetings that so we hear from the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Uh, last week, they put out a survey statewide uh, trying to gauge uh, whether or not uh, OHSA should move to delay the start of winter sports until January uh, or start on time or push back even further. So I uh, want to make sure I have as much information as possible before we make calls on, on all of the things to make decisions about, but one to try to get this information out to families as soon as possible so some people can start planning. Uh, so. Um, that's a. That's really the reason for making making the move this evening and waiting till Friday is just to buy buy some time for people. Uh, other updates, if uh, don't have anything else, uh, want to send a just a huge thank you to our staff. Uh, every member of our our staff has been amazing. Uh, we've had a lot of quarantines within our staff, and there were. No questions, no complaints. It was really put your head down, go to work, help cover for each other. Uh, people would reach out, what can I do to help? Uh, so want to thank our staff, our administrators uh, as well for uh, going the extra mile. Uh, every single person associated with this district has gone above and beyond the call of duty since, really since last March, but really during the start of the school year here, uh, to try to provide the best environment possible for health, safety, and education. So I wanted to say thank you to our staff members. And uh, on, on uh, the school side of things, there are a few pieces of legislation that I expect to be introduced in the coming days. Uh, Senate Bill 358 and uh, another proposed amendment to go on, I believe it's Senate Bill 89 that will deal with Ed Choice vouchers. If board members remember from uh, the spring, uh, Ed Choice vouchers were a hotly debated topic. Uh, and there's a strong push by Senate Republicans to address Ed Choice vouchers uh, in the next week or two. Uh, they do not want to get to uh, a break in their session. They'd like to address it during the lame duck session here. Uh, so we are we are watching that carefully. Uh, there are a couple of uh, interesting proposals out there on how the state will address uh, Ed Choice vouchers. Still collecting information. Some of that information just came out today. Uh, Senator Matt Huffman uh, is intending to uh, uh, propose uh, 
a new plan on how to choi how to address school uh, ed choice vouchers. So uh, I will collect more information on that and and send it out to board members as soon as possible. But just want to get it on your radar. There's also uh, a new funding formula that has been presented. Uh, last year, a lot of time was spent talking about the Cup Patterson funding formula that ultimately died uh, in in legislation. Uh, a revised formula has been presented. Bob Cup has now uh, moved up to speaker, and he's he's not as uh, associated with the bill, uh, but it is a bipartisan bill uh, that would address school funding. And uh, there's a lot of support statewide uh, for for the funding formula. Uh, next board meeting, I, I do plan to bring a uh, uh, that bill before the board members for their consideration and possibly passing a resolution in support of uh, the new funding formula. So uh, be looking for that to come as well, that information. So um, if, if the new funding formula could go through it, it would be uh, a huge benefit to our district. Uh, the biggest obstacle, uh, as with most things when it comes to school funding, is money. Uh, the, the current plan, uh, to be quite honest, I just don't, I don't think the money is there to support it as it's written. Uh, it, with all things COVID and the state of the economy, uh, I just don't know that the funding is there. It, it would be a tremendous bill for public education, would be great for Fairfield Union. So we obviously want to keep a very close eye on that. But uh, I, I will be passing that information to board members as soon as possible. And that is it for my updates this evening. Any questions? Okay. Uh, as always, uh, once a month, we try to uh, bring our administrators uh, to the board meeting to update the board on things going on in our buildings. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip the order a little bit, save Mr. Myers for last, uh, so I can drag this out as long as possible. Uh, uh, as board may remember, today is Mr. Myers' last day at uh, Fairfield Union, and uh, uh, you know we, we thanked him at a previous board meeting, and he has threatened me with violence if I... If I uh, get emotional on him again tonight, uh, <laughs> so I promised him I wouldn't do that, but I did ask Ms. Roberts to do the five-year forecast tonight so we can drag this board meeting out as long as possible <laughs> and keep him working until the very last minute. So uh, we'll put him on the end of the administrator updates, uh, <clears throat> and uh, since we're switching things up, you know, we'll always we'll put Mr. McPhail last because that'll take the longest. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Miller, if you'll if you'll go first, if you will step up to the middle, we have a microphone in the middle there. Uh, to help people home here. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are holding our own at Pleasantville. We are um, like all of the buildings. I, I can't thank staff enough for their flexibility. Um, we've had to do some pulling and shifting and things at the last minute, but everybody has done it with a great attitude and done it very well. Um, and so, again, I would like to reiterate thanking staff um, for all that they're doing and um, just for everything that they have taken care of. It's been a tough year, um, just lots of changes. And, and as teachers by nature, our hearts are with these kids. They kind of become your own kiddos. And you see them struggling um, between the different types of education, the holes that we have we've know that all of the kids have had. but. The teachers just are doing everything they can to help um, meet in small groups, meet individually, just to keep the kids caught up and, and doing what they need to be doing for growth. So that's been fantastic to see. Um, in the midst of all this, I always like to talk about some positive things that are happening. So we had two students, two fourth grade students approached me and said, could we start a Pleasantville Press? And I said, well, I think that's a great idea. And they said, well, we're going to write it tonight at home because they, they live in the same home. And I said, great, send me a copy. So, and that's one of the neat things with technology is all of the things that kids are able to do now that, you know, here they are, elementary kids, but they're typing up this whole four-page newspaper, sending it, sharing it with me. And then um, I would ask for a time where they either had study time in their classroom or a little bit of their free time. And they came down then to my office, and the three of us worked to edit it just on our own time. 
Um, and so this is a bi-weekly paper. Um, it's really very creative. Um, there's all kinds of neat things in there. They talked about the, the fourth grade uh, class president elections and um, one of the uh, kids that's writing this is big into quoting people. So he just goes around on the playground and has all these quotes and then gives, you know, if you want to apply for a job to be an interviewer, you can apply through an application that's in the press uh, that they are sending out to all the fourth grade students. And, um, and he lists things that, you know, you must be a good listener. That's the first rule. These are things that if you want to apply, you must be a good listener. You must have a good pencil and a pad of paper. And you must quote exactly what they say. <laughs> and I thought, you know, here we are, creative. And uh, so anyway, we've been doing this bi-weekly. We've had two editions. And they're probably going to get ready to start typing up the next one. Um, but they really are doing a neat job, and it's it's comical to read. So the teachers are all getting a copy, and all the fourth graders are getting copies of this newspaper. So um, in addition to that, this fourth grade class, I'm telling you, they are just go-getters. But they decided there weren't enough trees on our playground at Pleasantville. And so they started a petition at school. Who would like to sign the petition that we need more trees on the playground? <laughs> and so they have all these student signatures. <laughs> Um, that they and so they said could we plant more trees and I said well actually that's really not my property or your property so if we were really serious about doing this we would have to uh, get a plan together we'd have to present it to the school board and the superintendent so I will keep you posted on this but they are they are I went up for a few minutes and talked to the class they've got all these signatures um, and then they said, anybody who didn't get to sign that has permission to sign the posters that they've hung around the school, save the trees, add the trees, you know, whatever. So, and uh, one, one uh, student said her dad is willing to dig the holes. <laughs> and I thought, well, we'll talk to him also <laughs> before you volunteer him. But uh, so they have decided to kind of turn it into a PBL, um, project-based learning activity. And they're going to figure out the cost and the tools they need. And, and she is convinced that he has three saplings that he doesn't want that are waiting at their house that can be planted any time, you know. So anyway, so they've got to research when's the best time to plant a tree and how deep the hole needs to be and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we found out that one of the retired teachers at Pleasantville has left a donation for a tree that has never been planted. So. I kind of mentioned that to them. I said, if you're serious about this, you know, we really could, but it's going to require presenting it. And so we'll see in a couple of weeks. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, great group of kids and uh, certainly ambitious. So um, for November, Madison Stewart is our Apple Award winner. And uh, Madison is a new hire this year. And she was hired for the tutor position, but she's been subbing for uh, Deb Wright in the music position. And she's done a little bit of everything. She's been one of ours that gets pulled sometimes to cover as a sub. Um, and she's done it flawlessly. She's done it with great energy and enthusiasm and um, really has, has done a fantastic job. So I think she's very deserving of that award. Um, and then we're just a spotlight employee. Um, one of our kindergarten, new kindergarten teachers, Lauren Hahn, is doing a really neat activity, Thankful Days, and they've picked different people or things they're thankful for each day, and then they've done something special for that person. So uh, one day they were thankful for Mr. Gallagher, so uh, Mrs. Hahn had bought some donuts for him, little mini donuts that they gave him when he came to their room. Um, they were thankful for um, Linda Goodman, the cashier, and she also helps with their recesses, and she's also a tutor for them in the afternoon. She does some working, you know, with the students that are struggling. And so uh, they made her pictures, and they honored me one day and made me cards. And they honored Mrs. Peters one day and made her a video. So it's just a really neat activity, and the kids are really um, enjoying it. But it's just a neat way for uh, people just to feel appreciated. And so... I thought she would be a great spotlight. So that's about all I have for today. Um, our, our numbers, I was looking a little bit for attendance and things, and um, as is following suit with the research, um, we aren't having as many cases of um, positive cases popping up with the younger kids, but we have kids that have been exposed 
that have to be quarantined. So we are getting our absences are growing as well, um, probably equal to what's happening in the rest of the district. Uh, today, in fact, we hit the 10% mark of absenteeism um, from our school. So we're definitely seeing the hit, even though as of right now, we don't know of any at the younger years that have been tested positive um, for it. So any questions or? Oh, <clears throat> report. Okay, thank yeah, you. <laughs> Ms. Miller, I think Opie and his friends did a newspaper once. Be careful with that. What's that? I think Opie and his friends did a newspaper once and got out of the Yes. Well, well, I like to be, you know, making sure as an interviewer that you quote them exactly. I felt yeah. like that was a mm -hmm. great point. That, and that was so. my, my thought as well. And I, I was trying to bite my tongue, but now I can't. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought the same thing yeah. with them stating exactly what you quote, what's yes. going on today. So. Right, right. It'll be interesting for sure. So, <laughs> All thank right, you. thank Thanks. you. Mr. Ripple. Oh, it's harder. <laughs> it's harder and harder, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. A couple things. Um, uh, so since we last talked about a month ago, um, our November Apple Award winner is Miss Lindsay Badgley. She's one of our counselors. She bounced back and forth between the both buildings and just kind of, she's one of those people, much like everybody else on the staff, that goes above and beyond and does all kinds of stuff that you don't even ask. She just does it. And then you're like, oh, wow. And, and things you don't even think about. So she's just one of those kind of, Kind of people so she is that um i don't know if you all were aware we had an election um, <laughs> you pay attention to that um and the hot dog was the winning winner of our election um we had a contest amongst the whole building um and mrs neal brought in a hot dog suit and a banana suit um and the kids got to vote on which one mr ripple would wear for the day so um they did some persuasive writing and some some petitions and some some you know posters around the building and everything and the the hot dog was the winning overall winning costume so um we had a good time with that so i, I wore the hot dog costume throughout the day which was a good time um the uh, a great positive has been the, the friday collaborations um seeing the benefits of that amongst our building um, with our teachers pretty much everybody's all on the same page as far as working with lessons and everything else um first grade second grade all the way through um, walking in and seeing very similar, um, pretty much identical lessons per se, but everybody's all on the same page and we're all getting it. So it's it's really nice to to have that opportunity to work on those Fridays for the teachers to meet and get all that. Um, Veterans Day celebration, we had a virtual. Um, Mr. Miller, thank you to him. Um, and Mrs. Elliott uh, put together a couple PowerPoints for our, ta uh, for our staff to show to the kids and some videos and everything to kind of celebrate Veterans Day. Um, I know beginning of the year we had our fantastic Falcons. I think we were at like 40-ish or so. But in September we are up to 215 now. I think the game plan is to try to get to over a thousand by the end of the year, um, if not more. Um, the really nice thing about it is seeing more and more students writing fantastic Falcons for each other. Um, they're noticing each other, um, acknowledging, "Hey, so and so helped me with this, or so and so did that." Um, a great one I've got is I got a little kindergartner who are going to kindergartens are coming in from recess. He, he is our door guy and he, he holds the door for every single kindergartner. And I get to the door and it's like, come on, come on in. He's nope, Mr. Ripple, you go in before me. Like, okay. I'm not going to argue with you. So, um, just things like that. I mean, little things that again, you don't, don't see, you know, don't necessarily get on paper or anything like that, but just things that make a difference in the building. So, and, uh, I'll finish off with just a, a huge thank you to Mr. Myers. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Ripple. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Ripple. Appreciate it. Um, Ms. Vaughn. Good evening. I'm going to highlight for the middle school um, some elective classes this evening. I know that um, you know, I think in education, we're so drawn to academics and what they bring to the table. But I want to talk about um, some of our elective classes at the middle school this evening. Um, first of all, I want to talk about our technology classes. We have Mrs. Um, Stephanie McCoy, who is our new technology teacher this year. She is presently getting her master's in education um, for technology. 
And so she um, is able to bring a lot of that knowledge that she's learning in classes right now to um, as an application, you know, for her students that she's teaching every day. Um, when I was in her class last week and fifth graders were playing this game and one of the things that she really wanted uh, the students to have a full grasp of with their Chromebook is just all the different capabilities that the Chromebook has. So she has been working with the fifth graders on different shortcuts that the Chromebook um, has and how you access all the different pieces and parts of the Chromebook. So as they were playing this game, <coughs> she had, um, you know, um, then talked with me afterwards and she said, you know, the really cool thing about this game that the fifth graders played is that one of our eighth graders created this game for the kids. And so she had tasked her seventh and eighth grade technology classes with creating um, games for the fifth graders on these two different platforms. And so it was really cool to see our fifth graders actually participating in a game that our students in the eighth grade had created. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. I wanted to highlight that. Um, and then I want to highlight our wellness core. Our wellness core is uh, made up of four classes. Um, it is for those, these four classes and they rotate each nine weeks. Um, every single student has these four classes, fifth through eighth grade. And um, the first one is health. And when I was in there last week, the students were, they had been discussing stress. And um, such a great topic, I think, for these times. Um, you know, I think that even our middle school students, even elementary, I'm sure, students have varying levels of stress. And so they had talked about um, indicators of stress, you know, how they can notice if they are stressed, what they can do positively to overcome that stress. So just a really great lesson um, for our middle school students about that topic. Um, and then one day last week, I was in our wellness class. And that topic was power of positivity. So the lesson kind of surrounded itself about positive mindfulness and how if you are positive, you are typically more healthy. You have a lot more um, you know, things going for you. Um, you will often take risks that you may normally not take because there's just a different confidence level that you have. Um, and so <clears throat> that was just something that um, I wanted to share with you as well. Um, art, of course, is an outlet for many students. They can go in. We have pottery wheels where they you know, get to manipulate the clay and make pots, and um, we have canvas painting and so forth. So that is another, um, you know, outlet for our students. And then finally, <laughs> when I was in a phys ed class with Mr. Boucher, um, he was having a bad, they had had a unit on badminton, so they were having their badminton tournament. And um, so it was really neat to see um, one of our students who was pretty athletic and um, he was playing against another student who wasn't, you know, just as athletic. He actually crawled under the net and was demonstrating for the other student different ways that he could serve um, the little birdie. And so I just thought it was really neat to see that. I mean, I think these classes are teaching our kids to be um, great citizens, to show great character. And um, I don't know of another middle school um, that has these opportunities for the kids like they do at Fairfield Union. So um, I just, I'm, I'm so happy that our students get to have these opportunities. Um, one thing I want to talk about is our Falcon brunch that we had this last week. Um, Mr. Ripple and I actually had Falcon brunches last year. Um, however, we weren't able to invite parents, but we were able to go ahead and have that opportunity for our students um, this past week. And we had several students, um, almost 100, I believe, in our cafeteria where we had donuts and certificates and um, just celebrated them and their uh, good character that they bring to the school. Um, I also wanted to mention our Horace Man Apple Award. Um, and it was rightfully um, given to our custodians, Mr. McCarty, Mr. Gooseman, and Mr. Roberts. They are so very well deserving. Our uh, building has not been cleaner. Um, and they are, they just tirelessly work, um, you know, every single second they have, they're doing something to make sure that the uh, school was safe and clean. Um, and then I also want to, I don't want to leave without saying thank you to our staff. Um, they just go above and beyond every single day um, and just have stepped in um, all over to make sure that things have been running smoothly this year. Um, and I want to 
Thank you, Mr. Myers. Um, you've been a great example. Um, I, had, I didn't get a chance to work with you for long, but you definitely have been a great example of uh, what a good administrator should be. So thank you. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> no, I was getting ready to work. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Hahn, thank your staff, but I, I want to also thank Ms. Hahn, Mr. Ripple, Ms. Rice. Uh, when we <clears throat> put those four core classes together uh, and, and our staff, as she mentioned, it was really a, a vision or a dream. It's like, like, what if we could do something like this? And, uh, you know, we sat and talked about it, and then she took the idea and ran with it. and really helped craft it to what it is so uh, obviously the teacher's executing it flawlessly and it's working great but uh, kudos to mrs hahn and and mr ripple last year miss rice this year for overseeing that and and really helping that program excel so thank you for that uh, mr mcphill I have just a few things this evening. <laughs> I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. I'll be back. <laughs> no. um, you know, we, we've spent so much time talking about and dealing with the challenges of COVID that it's very easy sometimes to kind of lose sight of the fact that we do have students in this building, our seniors in particular, who are looking to a graduation come May. And, um, so we haven't lost sight of that. We do, uh, we've mentioned at various board meetings before that we do track each of our, our high school students' progress toward graduation. And I mention that only because we're entering into a testing window here now. Uh, starting the first week of December, we will be testing a very small number of students in end of course exams uh, based on some of the allowances that the state gave us last year uh, that gave us a little bit of relief for some of our students who were able to substitute uh, course grades from previous years in the, in the seven tested areas or test scores. So we felt like that was a very fair, appropriate thing. We appreciated the state doing that, but we do have uh, December 1st through the 9th in um, seven different core tested areas. We'll test a total of 17 students who are still working to fulfill their requirements toward graduation. And of course they receive remediation in the areas that they're gonna be tested in. But I did wanna point out to you that, that, that we are entering into, into that window. Uh, secondly, uh, in our CTE courses, in our elective courses, our concentrators, a concentrator is a student that's enrolled in their third year in any particular area, whether that's uh, um, uh, ag agricultural education or business or family consumer science. If they're in their third year, then they do take a web exam in the courses that they're enrolled in, in those CTE courses. And um, We'll be testing in four different semester courses. That would be business foundations, culinary fundamentals, career college readiness, and child development. We have 136 total students that we'll be testing uh, in those four areas. And again, those are the semester courses. And then we'll do the same thing again with our second semester courses. And of course, we have some year-long CTE courses that we've discussed previously, previously as well. So there'll be a second round of um, web exam testing in the spring. What I really wanted to talk to you about this evening was um, what really is a source of great pride and I think really kind of a cornerstone of, of our community and certainly our school system and, and that's the relationships, the cooperation and uh, the outreach that our school systems have, our buildings have with the various community resources. Uh, we've got a lot of, of coaches, advisors and teachers who are doing great work outside of Fairfield Union High School to go out and work with people in our community. We get feedback all the time about how many of our students are doing those types of things, how they behave when they do it, how they represent themselves, their families in this community. And I think that's just, I think that's just a reflection of, of you know, the families that we have working with us, the, the teachers and coaches that we have working with the students while they're here, and then the students themselves to buy into that and understand what our traditions are about. Um, just, you just go back to last February We've had um, our girls softball, volleyball, golf program, girls basketball, and then coming up in December, our FFA program, work with the Bremen Food Pantry in various different months, approximately every other month or so, every two or three months. Um, group of, as you know, five churches working together. They have a committee that, that organize uh, these, these uh, resources. 
they reach out to us and our coaches and teachers and advisors readily step up to go out and work with them. We appreciate the opportunity and um, our coaches have done a great job and advisors in, in, in the FFA have done a great job in, in providing that resource and that educational experience for our students. Then uh, most recently, I wanted to mention we had some very positive feedback uh, from last weekend. Uh, the Pleasantville Methodist Church has their turkey dinner and we had four different uh, student service organizations offer help and students to, to work with that. That was our FFA program, our FCCLA, our National Honor Society, and our student council. Again, provided 25 or 30 students to help with that project. I understand it was a huge success. And again, um, uh, really appreciative of the way our students and their, their uh, leaders uh, set that up so that they could, they could be a factor in that positive experience for our community. And then lastly, um, Kind of our crown jewel right now we mentioned it uh, at the last meeting uh, i think a little bit and that is our our student council shopping trip this is a biggie and it has presented many challenges this year given the given the circumstances and the uncertainties that we have with covid and what our situation is going to be in terms of where we're at in in our our educational process what what level we're on uh, that certainly made planning a very difficult uh, mrs toller and mrs cup have done an outstanding job just in general, putting this together over the last two or three years, but especially this year and being kind of relentless from the standpoint that they did not want this opportunity to go, to, to go away or this group of students this year to lose this opportunity, both on our end and at the elementary school end, just because we're dealing with the challenges of COVID. So they've put together a program that, uh, that we believe we're gonna be able to execute regardless of what educational uh, situation we're in. Uh, but um, each of the students will receive a $150 gift card. We plan to recognize 13 students from Pleasantville and 13 from Bremen. They'll each get a $150 gift card through our relationship that they have built with uh, the Coles company and then also with Frisch's. And Frisch's is making arrangements that if we can't have dinner and it doesn't look like we'll be able to, if we can't go there, they're going to make arrangements to, to bring that to us if we can get that worked out. And of course, you know, if, if, uh, we would be in session during that time. Uh, first week of December, so uh, given our, our new transition, we get to go back to school on December 7th. That first week that we're back, we'll have people out into those two elementary buildings. They'll be taking orders, uh, like individually, the, the, stu the elementary students will come down, we'll do that virtually. The advisors will be there. They're gonna type the orders in online. They'll submit that to the store. The store will organize it, so we'll pick it up. Each of the students will have their full uh, allotment of money. If they come up a little short, let's say that they only spend 130 of the 150, they'll get a gift card to kind of, uh, their parents can uh, then take them back and kind of uh, spend the rest of, of their allotted money. None of that would be possible without, in, typically in previous years, this is their, we, we've done fundraising to go out and raise the money to be able to fund this. This year, we were um, really blown away by the generosity of um, Elevated Integrity Construction Services, LLC. They stepped up on their own, were so appreciative and donated $3,900 to the cause. Why? Because they didn't want to see the opportunity go away because we were in a crisis as, as a community in the school system. So we are so thankful for the generosity of, of, of that company and, and stepping up for our students. Um, it, it is it is um, it is really humbling to watch the tenacity of of those two ladies go at that project. We we really feel strongly about it. It seems like it's it's catching on. I know the student council really feel strongly about it as well. They enjoy the process. It does look a little different this year. Um, we won't be able to use all of our student council members as shopping buddies on the front end, but on the back end, if we're in session and we can have on the delivery day. We will take our entire student council group to the two schools to be a part of, you know, helping the students get their stuff tried on and have their lunch. So, uh, again, just a few examples of the many, many, many things that, that our staff members, coaches, and advisors are doing all the time to, to work with the community. And then lastly, I wanted to mention, um, you know, we talk about COVID-19. Here at the high school, the past two and a half, three weeks or so, we have had a tough go with, with, with uh, you know, some, some tough luck with uh, COVID-19 in terms of 
you know, happen to do our social distancing. Not that we've had a lot of positive cases, it's just that we've had a lot of teams and students impacted and staff members impacted by the, uh, by the quarantine process. Um, that process is brutal, and uh, Mrs. Carol Osborne and, and uh, Mrs. Brenda George and our entire office staff, both the guidance office and the high school office, have stepped up big time to be able to handle those situations. Whenever you're contacting families, uh, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, 20, 25 families in a morning, and you're passing along that kind of news, that's not what people want to hear on a school day morning. And so you can imagine those conversations sometimes uh, are very difficult, and I just can't say enough how much we appreciate the professionalism and dedication that Mrs. Osborne and our office staff have shown uh, in handling that. Lastly, I'd just like uh, three quick congratulations. Um, our Marching Falcons had their first ever uh, Marching Falcons in concert in the stadium, and uh, it, was, it was fantastic. They did a very nice job adapting to that and making the best of a tough situation. Obviously, they would have rather, and we would have all rather been able to be in, been in the auditorium, but uh, thought they did a really good job kind of capping off their season uh, in the stadium with Marching Falcons in concert. I'd also like to congratulate publicly uh, Madison Iman, you saw on the signboard when you mm -hmm. pulled in, and we all know now that Madison has finished her high school running career in cross country. She was a three-time All-Ohio runner. She finished fourth in the state as an individual this year, just an outstanding high school uh, cross country career out of Madison, so I wanted to congratulate her. And then lastly, I'd like to uh, send well wishes to Mr. Myers. Um, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, the reason I'm in this district right now is whenever Mr. Myers transitioned from uh, the junior high to Rushville Middle School, that was my opportunity to become a part of your team. And, um, so, Mike, I want to wish you well in your retirement. I mean, clearly goes without saying your leadership and dedication to this community um, speaks for itself. But congratulations and enjoy. You've earned it. Hmm. <laughs> Let me have any questions for Mr. McCullough? Uh, before we get to remember, Mr. Myers, we'll point out, I, I want to say thank you to all of our administrators, Ms. Rice, Mr. Estadio as well, for being here this evening. Uh, very much uh, everyone wanted to be here as a uh, sign of respect and support for Mr. Myers uh, to let him know, uh, you know how much we appreciate all he's done for us. Uh, as administrators, he's definitely had an impact on all of us and been a good mentor to us. So with that, Mr. Myers, I'll have you take stage. And, sir, thank you. <laughs> I, I just have a few quick things. First of all, um, I wanted to go back to something. We had the third grade testing uh, that took place there in October. And I wanted to go back to our VLA students because we, we have uh, 24 VLA students that were in third grade uh, that when we took the state test. And kudos to uh, Ms. Schilling, uh, Mrs. Miller, Mr. Ripple, uh, Mr. Belleville uh, for you know allowing us to coordinate that. We had 23 out of 24 of those students take the, the state test. And the reason I point that out, and also with kudos to the parents and the students, is because most of our, our districts that surround us only could get about half of their kids come in to take that test. So we did very well uh, in that. Uh, we also did have some movement uh, with our VLA students. Uh, again, some due to medical concerns, family situations. Uh, right now, as of about uh, 5 o'clock this evening, uh, we had 281 students uh, that are in our VLA program. And again, just a quick thank you to the board, uh, Mr. Belleville, uh, the administrative team, community, students, for all the support. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Swing, keeping from sitting down. <laughs> I'm not making questions. <laughs> I, I just appreciate you showing up in shirt and tie tonight. <laughs> Mr. Bellwell suggested I wear uh, Crocs and shorts, but I said. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Smelter, that's all we have from all our right. administrators this evening. All right. We'll move along. Move to number three.
recognition of visitors, public comment. We actually do have an individual this evening, Mr. Ben Conkey. You will step right up, sir. Mm. We just ask you to keep around three minutes. Oh, yeah? Yep. <laughs> well, I just moved here from Sheridan Local Schools. Okay. Uh, my daughter's been quarantined now for 14 days. She's falling behind in school. Why is it we can't get an online program to where she's with the class and up the time? The class starts at 720. Instead of waiting until noon for work, why couldn't they be logged into their Zoom or whatever and participate in the class so they don't fall behind? I'm a, we, we do have some staff members that, that hold live Zoom meetings, but not all of our, or, or Google Meets, but not all of our staff members hold live sessions during class. Um, I mean, wouldn't that help keep some of the kids that could stay at home? at home to lower the populations in the schools? I mean, we, we can't force teachers to put a live feed in their classroom. Um, we did have some issues in the spring uh, with some live feeds of uh, people getting in the background or uh, interrupting the class, and it, it did create some issues for us with, with the live uh, stream. So like I said, we, we do have st some staff members doing it, but we cannot force everyone to put a live camera in the classroom. It wouldn't be a live camera. It would be your peer, wherever you're teaching the class off already. And that, Just that, the lectures, you know, so that way they can get on with their work and not have to do the Google search. The teacher done top the lesson. And our teachers are taping lessons and posting them to the Google Classroom. Uh, but as far as just having a, a live feed through the uh -huh. computer while the class is ongoing, uh, we, we can't force the staff to do that. Uh, I'm just trying to figure this out. Like you said, you're going to put it back to code red, and now she's 14 days behind, missed 10 tests so far, failing about all classes. And your daughter's at the high school? Yeah. My, I don't understand why she would be missing tests. Because he won't, they won't give the test to her line or let her take it back. Mr. McPhil? I'll have to look at I talked to uh, what Bo Brandon, and he said I will not let allow students to take tests at home. Well, it's, we'll we'll address Mr. Mr. McFell, Mr. Bustadio, you guys, and Todd over this situation already. And and I did refer you to Mr. McFell, and yep. I hadn't heard yep. anything yep. since, so I I assume that well, I the testing hear back from him. My daughter hadn't even got a bunch of emails or phone calls yet either. But he thought he'd have all the answers Friday. We'll, we'll get with the teacher tomorrow morning, make sure work. I'll just try to get it figured out. Sure. If you're going back in quarantine, I mean, it's just given days now. Well, we obviously education has to continue. And if it's not working the way it should, we'll, we'll address that immediately. Uh, I will get in touch with the teacher tomorrow as well as the administrators and figure out why we don't have work going home, uh, in a timely manner. I mean, I think we've got a communication breakdown. Those teachers, those teachers have had multiple contact with your daughters. Well, I can give, you, I can show you the emails also. If she had to send an email out Friday because she hadn't heard nothing besides from two or three teachers.
We have two items from Ms. McCandlish. Uh, there are two letters that we have to have addressed every year, uh, compliance with nutrition standards, and then we also have the monthly food service report for August and September. Uh, the compliance with nutrition standards uh, is just a notice that we need to give to the Board of Education every year and happens about the same time of year every year. So uh, that letter is there uh, for Ms. McCandlish. Um, and then before I turn over to Ms. Roberts, uh, Mr. Conkey, you're more than welcome to stay the rest of the evening, but if you don't want to stay, it's not considered rude to leave, but I just wanted to let you know, because okay, we're going to be getting into our five-year forecast this evening as well, so it's probably going to be a while. So just wanted to let you know, you're more than welcome to stay as long as you want, though. So, all right. Thank you for being Thanks, here. We'll be, we'll be in touch tonight. All right. Um, well, I think Mr. Kimmel no. wondered why Sally wasn't here. Oh, well, I, you know, I keep trying. I keep trying. So, uh, Ms. Roberts, uh, financial items? Yeah, I have two financial items uh, this evening. I'm actually going to keep them both pretty short, considering, like you said, we do have our uh, five-year forecast. So, the first thing really is just um, the October financial report. Again, I'm going to keep this real short. I'm going to skip down to the uh, section that is labeled overall. Um, basically, if you look at our month of October, our revenues were in excess of expenditures by $420,000. This is because we received our income tax statement for the month or for the quarter. Um, so that's really where that is coming from. If you look at our overall cash balance, we ended the month at $13.7 million versus um, 12.7 last year. Um, the district is forecasted at this point in time to end of the year at 11.9 million, but you will see I'm gonna take that up over a little over 12 million. Um, and the forecast. So unless you have any questions, um, I am going to just leave the um, the monthly forecast at that point, unless you guys have any questions. Questions, comments? All right, thank you. Okay, the only other thing I have is real quick is for the insurance report for the month. Um, overall for health and dental insurance, we are in a really good spot. Um, we did have a little bit tougher of a month for health insurance. Uh, and we basically saw kind of dollar in, dollar out, um, which means that we actually set the rates exactly where they needed to be for the month. So we did have an excess of about $7,000 of revenue for the month um, that did get added to our cash balance. So we ended the month just under $1.5 million um, compared to $730,000 last October. Again, a big piece of that was because we did receive a check back uh, earlier in the month, earlier in August um, from our old insurance consortium. So we're sitting in a good spot. We do need to be sitting in that spot considering we are self-funded. Um, and like I said, we had a little bit of a rough month in October. We did see expenditures increase, um, but they were overall decreased to last year, just higher than we had seen previous months. Um, Let's see. Again, I think I'm going to keep the insurance report pretty quick um, just because there's not a ton of new news to report on it. So unless there's any questions, that is all I have on those two reports for this evening. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is 4.3. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda items. So moved. Do my Mr. Myers, can I get a second? Second by Mr. Hoffman, Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. yes. Motion passes. That moves us to number five, new business section 5.1. Motion to approve addition of DECA program at Fairfield Union High School. If you remember back uh, the last board meeting in October, uh, we had Mrs. Swift at our board meeting to present the DECA program. And uh, uh, as I explained last board meeting, I simply forgot to put it on the agenda for approval. So we can't bring it forward tonight. Uh, if you felt you wanted to add anything to it, but we all have a pretty good handle what 
Need a motion to approve? Move by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? I will second that. Mrs. Robert? Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Kemmerer? Yes. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Boat? Yes. My motion passes. That moves to 5.2. Uh, motion to approve the transfer of Deanna Throckmorton from high school secretary to administrative secretary for educational services <coughs> effective November 17th. We talked about this uh, move in an effort to uh, fill the void of Mr. Myers' retirement and uh, excited uh, uh, to have Ms. Throckmorton make this transition. She does so much uh, for the district behind the scenes and, and helping with uh, a lot of the functions that uh, flow through Mr. Myers's office. So we feel like this would be a, a very seamless transition for the district. Uh, we hate to see her leave the front desk of the high school. Uh, she's been in that position for quite some time and such a, uh, a pillar for that uh, operation at the high school. Uh, but uh, for the greater good of the district, we believe this is a solid move and, and uh, we'll move forward with posting her position. We posted her position this afternoon in anticipation of the board approving this so would recommend that right. questions comments need a motion to approve so move mr president move by mr kimmer can i get a second i'll second it second by mr boat mrs roberts mr kimmer yes mr boat yes. yes mr hoffman yes mr smeltzer yes mr myers yes, yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.3. Motion to approve supplemental personal service contracts as presented. Yes, we have uh, two there. Shane Ruby for middle school wrestling and uh, Ms. Fox Cottle for reserve winner cheer. So uh, excited to have those uh, individuals join our coaching ranks this year uh, and uh, would recommend we approve those as presented. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.4. Motion to approve supplemental contracts as presented. I would like to recommend the board. Uh, Governor DeWine required each school district to have a COVID coordinator uh, that would be in charge of coordinating with health departments and handling quarantines and tracking uh, data for the district. Uh, Ms. Osborne, our school nurse, uh, readily stepped up and volunteered for that position. Uh, she viewed it as her responsibility as a school nurse to, you know, she, she cares deeply for this district and these kids and treats every single one of them like they're her own children. And uh, she just, you know, she felt like that was her responsibility. And uh, she has fought me over making this recommendation. Uh, she very much views, like I said, she views that as her job to, to take care of our kids. However, the COVID coordinator position has become uh, quite the responsibility. And uh, she is spending uh, just an incredible amount of time every single day, seven days a week, uh, and tabulating this mountain of information, keeping track of it, and uh, calling parents. And, uh, you know, they, they always talk about, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I mean, at at the worst possible time, she is the person that is on the front line making that call and you know, catches a lot of emotions from people, good, bad, and uh, otherwise, and, and she handles it with grace. Uh, she spends a lot of time with parents talking through the situation, making sure they understand, answering questions, uh, has just done an incredible job. Uh, so. Uh, with this being a required position uh, that Governor DeWine has, has placed on us uh, and uh, the fact that we can use uh, some of our CARES funding 
uh, to help facilitate having a COVID coordinator, I would recommend we uh, give uh, Ms. Osborne a supplemental contract for the administrative duties that she is uh, required to uh, perform as the COVID coordinator. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boak. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Boak. Yes. yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.5. .5. Motion to approve a memorandum of understanding with the Fairford Union Education Association. Mr. Bill. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Denny, the executive board of the association, and uh, our, our teaching staff uh, for working with us to try to help shape uh, what things will look like in a red status level. We want to make sure we have clear expectations for our students and families. Uh, we'll share this information out with our families over the course of the next three days. Uh, just a, a more rigid structure to how the day should flow, uh, specific hours of when students should be engaged in doing work, uh, hours in the evenings when our teachers will be available to parents who, if a parent's working all day and then can't help their child till the evening and has some questions and needs some, some help and backup, uh, when our teachers will be available to them in the evening. So really appreciate uh, our, our teachers helping construct uh, a schedule to give to our families so they know exactly when and where uh, uh, the expectations are and where their help's coming from uh, as we go down this path over the next couple of weeks. So um, I would uh, recommend that we approve that memorandum of understanding on uh, kind of educational practices during a red status. Any questions, comments on the MOU? Need a motion to approve? Move, Mr. President. Move by Mr. Kimmer. Can I get a second? No second. Second by Mr. Myers. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. <coughs> sorry, I didn't hear. Mr. Hoffman, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.6. A motion to approve fruit, food service department vendors as presented. Excuse me. Uh, Another reason to go on Ms. McCandlish uh, for not being here to explain this stuff, but every year we need to bring vendors to the board for approval uh, for serving our food, uh, our food services department. So uh, four vendors listed there, Gordon Food Service, Cisco, Cincinnati, Alfred Nichols Bakery, and United Dairy, and they, it's, uh, they provide supplies to our, to our kitchen staffs. Okay. Need a motion to approve? Moved by Mr. Hoffman. I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Um, Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Boat? Yes. Mr. Kimmer? Yes. Mr. Myers? Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.7. Motion to approve November five year forecast and notes. Okay, so I have attached the five-year forecast um, for everybody to view. This forecast is, the presentation piece of this is 24 pages long. I will tell you, we're not going to go through all 24 pages. Um, I'm going to really focus on three pages and I'll walk you through those. So the first page I want you to look at is page number three. This is just the overall high level forecast summary. And if you look at kind of at the very middle of the page, this is really just the high level forecast for fiscal year 2021. We began our year at $11.4 million. In this forecast, I'm forecasting that we'll have revenue of $24.2 million with expenditures of 23, almost 23.7. That would give us a revenue surplus of $576,000 for the year, ending the year at $12,022,000. Uh, 
Um, next, what I'm going to do is walk you through the revenue, and then I will walk you through um, the, the expenditure piece of this. So for the revenue, what I'm going to do next is walk you all the way back to page 22. I'll give you a quick second to get there. And I'm going to walk through some of the high-level line items for this. Um, the details of these are all in the pages between 3 and 22. Um, there's a lot of details. There's a lot of graphs. The graphs will tell percentage changes from year over year. I'm going to walk through some of those high-level percentages and really focus on the areas that have made a difference to the district. Um, obviously, that being said, with COVID in place, uh, you know, we have about half of the year done as far as income taxes, as far as property taxes, and also state funding. So we've seen a good portion of where our funding is coming from, and I feel pretty good about where we're projecting the rest of the year to sit. Um, this is pretty similar to the forecast that I presented in May. We are seeing a slight increase in some of the revenue. Um, it is being offset by getting some additional expenditures out there. Um, so overall, not drastically different, but I am projecting our year to come in about $150,000 higher than I was projecting um, the forecast in May. So that being said, overall, if I look at total revenue, um, our revenue is up $309,000 to last year. I am projecting our revenue to sit at $24,241,000. Um, that is uh, up 1.3% to last year. Over the past five years, we averaged an increase of 3%. Um, so you can see that basically that 1.3 is lower than the past five years. However, with everything going on, I just felt like it was not, um, we didn't have any indicators telling us that we would sit at that average. So I did take that down to about a 1% increase um, almost in line with revenue from last year. Things have shifted around slightly but at a high level, we're up $300,000 to last year. The items that are really driving that, the first being property tax. So we've talked about it several times in my monthly updates. We saw a 21% increase in property taxes in 2020. We are still seeing some of that carryover. That was from the reappraisal that went. Fairfield County saw a really strong increase. Um, so our next reappraisal will be in 2022. I have that sitting at a plus 5%. We are getting some indications that that could actually be higher. The home values right now in the county and with, with home sales, uh, homes are selling very, very quickly. Um, we are seeing home values continuing to increase, which is why we're seeing an increase in property tax values, even above and beyond that 21%. So the next reappraisal I have at plus five, we could see a slight increase from that. However, at the same time, we just don't know what these next years could bring. So while we're seeing some carryover from that original increase, I am holding our next reappraisal at up 5%. So we'll pay, I'll keep a close eye on it. But overall, that's where one of our indicators is coming in. The next is income tax. You can see that I am taking income tax to 5.1 million. Last year, we were at about 5,244,000. Um, that is down 2%. Um, so far this year, we've been, been, we have been down about 5.4%. And looking at all the indicators and working with some other people in the area, um, most districts actually did recover the majority of the decrease that they saw in the first quarter income tax decrease. They did recover that in the second. We did not. However, um, we do think that we will see some of that come back in our next two quarters. If we were to keep a 5% decrease and hold where we've seen the first two quarters come in, that would be uh, $260,000 below last year versus the 117 I'm seeing right now. So it could be about an additional $140,000 of revenue that could come off of this if we were to hold that 5% trend. Um, so we do have you know, about $140,000 of unknown that I am putting into revenue, but we could see that sway a little bit over the next two quarters. 
The next piece of this is state funding. Um, I am holding this flat to 2020. And if you remember at the very end of last fiscal year, the last few months, everybody saw a cut in state funding. We were cut $338,000. What I am doing for this year is I'm holding our year flat at about $9.2 million from the state. So while I'm not seeing it decrease anymore, I'm also not going to increase it at this point. Next year, so fiscal year 22, what I'm doing is I'm increasing it 3% and then holding it flat year after year from there. So basically, until we really know, I know Mr. Belleville mentioned what the new funding plan and what the new calculation will give us. Um, there's still a lot of unknown. So until we see some more indicators of that, um, I am holding this pretty much flat and I'm not drastically increasing or decreasing. So again, flat for 2021, up 3% for 2022, and then flat from 2022 after that. So we're hovering right around $9.2 million each year. You'll see when we jump back up to 2022, we jump up to almost, or I should say a little over 9.4, and then we can hold right in that area um, through 2025. So for right now, no major indicators one way or the other. Hopefully we will receive some new information on this calculator by the time we get to the May forecast, and I'll be able to better project that go forward for future years. But for right now, we are, I am holding it at that $9.2 million for this year. Um, the other piece of this is actually interest. Um, you can see I took this down um, about $150,000 from this for this year. Um, and really what that is, is it's interest from some of our investments. So earlier in the year, I moved some investments. Um, we moved them around and we're now working with meter investment. Um, and moved it out of STAR. We're really seeing interest rates out of STAR decline. Um, everybody's seeing this, it's from banks, it's from STAR Invest, it's everywhere. So we are seeing that major decrease. I'm actually projecting that we're gonna see a decrease of $150,000 just in interest from our investments. Um, we have about $18 million invested. Um, about 15 million of it right now is sitting with meter and about 3 million we left with STAR. Uh, the star investments we can get to very, very quickly versus our meter investments are a little longer. They're about a year out. Um, so we are purposely doing that because we could get a little bit higher interest rate out of meter. However, we couldn't get our hands on the cash quite as quick. So knowing what we needed over the next year, we were willing to move some of that out to recover some of that interest. Um, however, you know, as everybody knows, the market interest rate is just very low right now. So I am cutting that by about $150,000. Um, other items that go into that other are casino revenue. So we did cut casino revenue by about half. Um, it, you know, it's it, just with the unknown of what could happen with casinos over the next few months, we're cutting it in half. So, and that's really where everybody has been seeing. That's kind of where uh, the market is. That's what most districts are doing at this point is cutting casino revenue in half. Other items to point out in revenue, and this would not affect our general fund, but just something to point out is we do receive wellness dollars. We received about $460,000 last year. We are supposed to see an increase in that over the next few years. However, I am planning to hold this flat. The reason I'm mentioning that is because while it's not revenue to our general fund, if that moves around and if we either see a decrease in that or see an increase, it could move how we pay for some things and how we you know, fund some of our expenditures. So these revenue dollars could shift around a little bit based on how that wellness money is received. As of right now, we're being told it will, you know, it will not change and that we will continue to see an increase, but it's just something that I feel like is an unknown. So we're right now keeping that flat. We're not taking it out, but we're keeping it flat. So again, while that wouldn't go into our general fund, it could affect how we fund other items of the business. Um, Okay, that's the majority of our revenue piece of this. I've kept it purposely pretty high level to really focus on the big pieces of revenue. But before I move into expenditures, are there any questions or anything I can hope to clarify? Okay. Seems good. Okay, so I'm going to move into expenditures. 
Um, just a reminder, I have expenditures this year forecasted at $23,665,000. Um, that is compared to $23,145,000. Uh, so that is a $520,000 increase or a 2% increase. Um, it is pretty average compared to our last five years. So while our total expenditures are increasing on average, you will see some shifts in the type of expenditures and how we are spending our funds. The first being salaries. Uh, I am projecting this year's salaries to come in at $10,861,000 compared to about $10,700,000 last year. Um, as a reminder, in salaries over the last three years, we're at a 3% increase, 2% increase, and 2% increase. So we are going into negotiations this coming spring. This forecast has a 1.5% increase in salary in it. So keep that in mind that we're coming off of a 322, and these numbers reflect a 1.5 for the next three years. This also represents um, several added positions throughout the district in order to support where Mr. Belleville thinks that we will need some additional support. Obviously, coming off of a year of, you know, extensive virtual learning and, um, you know, just a different type of education, we, he's really focused and we've really, you know, been able to work together to figure out a way to fund some, um, you know, different positions, some increased aids, some increased ISs, um, you know, so over the next five years, we work together to really look at what he thinks the district needs. And I'd say, I think we both feel pretty confident that and happy that we were able to get those in. So if I look over the next five years um, and really look this year in 2021, we're sitting salaries sit at about $10.8 million. By the time we get to 2025, it's just under $12 million at $11,991,000. So it is obviously a pretty significant increase um, in the salary piece of it. Um, and keep in mind, this is including steps as well as the percentage increase and then obviously any additional new salaries. The other nice thing I'll say actually is with the new tools that we are using for our forecast, I've been able to really go in and detail out every single position that we have either added or retired or people who have left the district. So we've been able to really get a pretty more or less exact picture of where we think salaries will come in. Um, and then I've also been able to trend out based on, you know, people who retire. And then when we rehire, um, you know, a lot of times when you're retiring, then the great thing about our district is people who are retiring who have been with the district for many, many, many years. So as you rehire, you tend to rehire somebody at a, um, you know, at a, at a lower step or a lower salary. So what we've been able to do is really trend that out over the next five years and look at what impact that has on the district. In addition to the exact positions that we know um, have changed you know, have changed going into this year. So I feel really good about where um, salaries and personal services are sitting. Um, so we will kind of see how this plays out, but uh, it is a pretty significant increase by the time we get to 2025. It is one of the things, if you look at the details of the forecast that is called out, that it is growing at a faster rate than it has in the past five years. So it's something that as we talk about controlling expenses and we talk about controlling you know, the unknown, this is one piece. It makes up about 43% of our expenditures. So this is a huge piece that we really have to watch, really have to monitor um, and ensure that we, uh, you, you know, are watching that trend because even as of right now, it is trending higher. It's increasing at a quicker rate than it has in the past. Um, okay, if I jump down to line 3.02, employee benefits. Um, basically, what you'll see here is that, as you know, going into this year, we uh, moved away from our consortium and created a self-funded plan. We are seeing our benefit costs flat to last year. Keep in mind, this line item actually entails health benefits. It also includes all the retirement um, workers, con it includes all of those items. So it's not just health insurance benefits. However, the insurance piece is the majority of this expenditure. So 
If you would actually compare this to um, the past, basically over the next five years, by moving away from the consortium, we are projecting to save $2 million over the next five years. So, and what that entails, it was flat for this year, and so far that's what we're seeing. So this year is coming in pretty much where we saw. It is an 8% increase in healthcare benefits go forward. I will tell you that industry trend right now is at 12%. Um, so even working with our advisor, while we are projecting an 8% increase for the next few years, we are still sitting under in, um, industry standard. So I feel really good about it. We will obviously, you know, continue to look at that and we'll know a lot more once we get more of the year under our belt and when it comes, you know, closer to spring. Um, but we are feeling like an 8% increase going into the next few years is pretty accurate. But again, I'm feeling really good that we were able to save, projecting to save $2 million over five years. Um, that money will just go back to, um, you know, back to our fund. And really the way we're able to do that is, you um, you know, just just having a huge partner in United Healthcare, and then also you know with Delta Dental and BSP, um, we're really able to use their um, their network and really look at that and really be able to save um, costs, save expenditures, um, and then we'll continually reevaluate. You know, obviously year after year, but feeling good about where benefits is sitting. Um, the next piece is purchase services. So this is anything that we are spending money on that isn't a supply. It's something like attorney expenses or maintenance expenses. It's not the actual supplies, but it's paying for somebody to come do work. Um, this is also where we pay the ESC. Um, so we, you know, it's utility expenses. These are all those types of service expenses. Uh, over the last five years, we have seen a 4.8% increase. I am projecting a 1.4% increase over the next five years. So this is obviously a decrease in trend. However, there are a few things that are going into that. First and foremost, which is the biggest saving of expenditures, is the, um, the energy project that the district went through in 2018. We know that we're projecting to save several million dollars by doing that. Uh, so that's a huge one that obviously was increasing that that's one major reason why our average for the next five years is going down. The other thing I am calling out is that I am increasing our legal expenses for this year by $25,000. In the past, we've spent about $60,000 a year. I'm projecting we'll probably spend closer to $85,000 this year. Obviously, just with everything COVID related, we are on the phone with attorneys, you know, making sure we're following everything and we're just, we're seeing some increased expenses out of legal fees. So really wanting to make sure we account for that. I do not think that's a go forward thing. Hopefully I'm seeing that as just a one year projection. So I did increase it for 2021 and then took it back off in the future years. Um, but it's something to call out that we are, we obviously are aware of. Okay. Yes. Sorry to stop you there for a second, but, um, I'm not a big financial person, so, um, and like I used to tell my teachers, you know, this is probably a stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, okay. Back to the personnel services, that's mainly the teacher salaries, correct? Yeah, it's salaries across the district, but yes, the major piece of that is salaries. And so you said you have, you've put in like 1.5 every, yep. every year? Yep. Now we're coming, we're coming off, you said like a three, two, two, correct? Correct. So uh, I guess we have to understand finances. So why, if we're coming off a three, two, two, why would you only protect 1.5, you know? Well, so, we, you want to go ahead, Courtney, or? Yeah, we've looked at several different ways. Um, we've looked at several different ways. And keep in mind, this is a one five, but it's also a step in the salary. So the other thing is looking at, you know, looking at the industry and looking where other um, districts are going so far. There's a lot of people going into negotiations this spring. Um, it's, you know, it's up for negotiation. However, there are pieces of it that as we look at where the district finances are sitting, if we were to increase that to a 2% increase, that would cost the district for an additional $400,000. So as we are looking at where we believe we need to come in, 
And in order to efficiently make sure that we're managing expenses, this is one of the areas that with it being, you know, 43% of our expenses, it's one of the areas that um, is such a huge expense to the district that it's, you know, it's where we felt like we needed to come in at this point. We have looked at it other ways, um, but knowing, you know, kind of having so many unknowns at this point of what COVID could mean, how long it could last. Um, we have a levy coming up next year, a renewal levy. Um, there are several pieces of it that there's so many unknowns that in order to keep us, you know, good in a good place financially, uh, I really felt like this was the best move for at this point for this forecast in this point in the year. Uh, you know, also, you know, you point out, you know, we did a three, two, and two. We gave uh, the association a, a, a step back that had been frozen years previously. Um, you know, this year we had zero percent increase on right. the insurance. So, you know, we we've tried to do everything we can to you know support staff and those type of things. So, I mean, you know, you you project out and you you look at our five-year forecast in years four and five, it's projected deficit spending in year three, you know, it's basically break even at 52,000. Yeah. So uh, if, if you go above, you know, just as, you know, for us, we're saying that at 1.5, 1.5, 1 1.5, these are what the numbers are. If that increases to two, two, and two, you're into deficit spending in year two mm -hmm. of the five-year forecast. So, you know, it, I, I will say the pre presenting the five-year forecast this way is different than probably just about 99% of school districts in Ohio uh, because up front, you know, Ms. Roberts has said, listen, we're not going to sit here and say no raise for teachers or bus drivers or aides or co That's it's, it's unreasonable to say right. that. So here is where I think we can afford like this is what we feel like we can afford and not be into deficit spending so you know it's kind of like showing your hand a little bit before negotiations and just trying to be very upfront open and honest and uh you know it's a 1.5 but we feel like with insurance rates staying down that supplements that 1.5 so you know just really trying to establish transparency going into negotiations to make those easier you know, we've worked really hard over the past five years, myself, Mr. Denny, the association, the board. You know, we've worked really hard to have a good relationship and you know, not trying to hide anything. It, it's, it is what it is. These are the numbers, and uh, this is what we think we can afford. So, Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I think that's exactly right. And I think that um, to Mr. Belleville's point, I think that's one piece is that knowing had we have stayed with the insurance consortium, we – more than likely would be seeing a 16 to 18% increase year after year in our insurance costs. So not only were we able to keep flat this year, only projecting to go up 8% next year, we would have seen a 16% increase this year and then an additional 16 to 18% year after year after that. So in a sense, that's a savings right there that is not taken from, you know, as a deduction from employees. So. To Mr. Belleville's point, it is something, you know, showing our cards a little bit up front, um, but really looking at where the bottom line is coming in over the next five years and knowing that we have some critical decision points within the district um, in order to not deficit spend, you know, to prolong that as far as we can. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we, the district has done a great job so far this year. I've really put pressure on to only spend where we need to spend. And I think the district has done a great job and spent on things that are very meaningful. Um, and I think that has, that has really helped. And you'll actually see some of that as I talk through the rest of the rest of some of these expenditures. But, um, but yes, I would agree. I, you know, it's something obviously we're very, uh, very aware of. And, and obviously we, you know, we want to be we want to be cautious of it and, and want to you know understand what that means to everybody um, okay okay next I'm going to jump down into supplies um, this is line 3.04 
You can see last year we spent $619,000 on supplies. I'm projecting $794,000 this year. That's a 28% increase. There's two major things that went into it, and we've talked about it. We basically moved our Chromebook expenditure from PI into general fund. That's $100,000 purchase each year. The main reason for doing that is originally when Chromebooks were purchased, they were considered, you know, they were a lot more expensive per Chromebook. They had a longer life, um, you know, we were wanting to get a longer life cycle out of them. We now know we are spending $100,000 every year on Chromebooks. Um, and just based on, you know, the bulk quantities that we're getting, we are able to purchase those out of general fund at this point. So we did move that over to general fund. The other piece of this is that we had a $75,000 purchase in curriculum for this year. It was um, a piece of the, you know, the $225,000, $75,000 hit this year. The other piece of this is if you look at uh, each year go forward, I've actually projected $100,000 in curriculum per year for new curriculum purchases. The purpose of that is to really get on a rotation so that we are spending on average $100,000 in curriculum on something new. This is, this is above and beyond just kind of the day in and day out, you know, services that we are already using. This is a new curriculum purchase. My reason behind that is it's a lot easier to kind of weather a $100,000 purchase each year and get everything on our rotation versus not purchase anything and then five years from now have to spend $500,000 and take a $500,000 hit in one year. So this way it's kind of a double edge. We can, you know, we can get it on a rotation. It's easier from a financial standpoint and then working with Mr. Belleville, it will really help so that you know, there's a subject or a grouping of subjects or whatever it may be that each year they are getting some new curriculum purchases. So those two things between the Chromebooks and then the curriculum, that's why we're seeing our supply increase, our supply um, forecast increase drastically. At first glance, that's obviously a very big increase and it is not within a five-year average. Uh, however, I, we do feel that those two two items would, you know, be beneficial to the district to ensure that we're purchasing those out of general fund. Um, the last piece of expenditures that we need to talk through this evening is um, in other. This is in transfers. So keep in mind, this entails two things. It's currently um, that we have to transfer the 0.75% of our 2% of income taxes. So it's basically equates to about 38% of the income tax settlement that we get in each quarter. We transfer that to our, our debt fund. We need to do one additional transfer this year out of general fund. We are projecting that we need to transfer $250,000 into food services. Um, really with, um, you know, the hard work that uh, the food services team has done Unfortunately, we're just not seeing the revenue this year that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, and, and, and I will tell you, this is very common amongst districts at this point. Um, most people are not seeing nearly the revenue that they've seen in their past. So in order to continue, you know, the food services that we need to, to get meals to the students, we do feel that we need to do a one-time transfer of about $250,000. Um, the past few months, we have overspent about $40,000 per month compared to revenue that we're bringing in. At this point, we have enough cash in the food services fund to basically get us through the end of February into March. Uh, and then we will need to make a transfer. So I'm not going to transfer these funds yet, but I will, you know, and we'll have to get it approved through a board meeting, but this is projecting a $250,000 transfer from general fund into food services. You know, ideally food services is something that is self-sustaining. However, that being said, you know, nobody could have ever projected a pandemic that, you know, we just are, it's, it's a very different year for food services. So we are projecting a $250,000 transfer. Um, let's see, any questions in total expenditures? Okay, um, overall, uh, we've talked about, you know, I've mentioned it, but just as a reminder, we started the year at 11, just under $11.5 million. As of right now, I'm projecting the year to come in at 12022 
we are projecting a deficit spend by year 2024. Um, you can see in years 2023, it is very close. We're within $52,000. So that's basically, you know, a teeniest little swing of anything. And we could be deficit spending. Honestly, we could start deficit spending next year, um, really just depending on, you know, a tiny little swing coming out of things. So um, it's a very close budget. I think we're in good standing. That being said, we need to really continue monitoring our expenses um, with a lot of unknowns with, we don't know at this point exactly where state funding is going to land. We don't know what the new formula could be. We don't know, you know, how long COVID is going to last. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a levy that would come up. Um, it is a PI levy. It expires at the end of this year. Um, so, you know, that's something that we you really need to look at general fund um, just to make sure that that's in a healthy balance, um, you know, to really ensure we can, we can afford all potential cases that could get thrown at us. Um, but overall, we're feeling really good. Um, you know, I, I've said it several times, but I really appreciate when I look back and look at the expenses that we have, you know, incurred so far this year, I feel like the things that we're spending money on are things that the district really needs to move forward and to ensure that the students are, you know, getting the education, we're looking at curriculum and really looking at those big purchases. So overall feeling really good about where the district is sitting, just still calling out, we have a lot of unknowns this year, as with, I would imagine, every treasurer presenting a forecast this evening is probably saying that same thing. So um, just kind of protecting what we can and, and working through what we can control um, so that when things that we can't control are thrown at us, we're, we're in a good place to, to weather those changes. Any questions overall? Um, I know I took you back to the very back page. Um, I just feel like there's a lot of detail in those middle pages. Obviously, if anybody reads through and has questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I also know that it's a lot of detail, so I really wanted to stick to the high-level points to make sure that we, you know, kind of big picture know what's going on within the district. Is that okay. That is all I have for the forecast, then. Thank you, Courtney. All righty. <clears throat> I need a motion to approve the November five year forecast and notes. I move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kemmer. Can I get a second? All second. Second by Mr. Myers. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Motion passes. That moves us into number six, 6.1. Uh, these are about the policy revisions that we've. Yeah, we have four policy, policy revisions uh, as presented from the Ohio School Board Association. Uh, as first reading, so just putting them there for board members to see tonight. We'll have further discussion on those uh, December. Seventh at our next board meeting. Okay, moves to six point two. Courtney, did you have anything else? Um, I really don't. The only thing I just kind of want to keep everybody aware of is that we are. I've mentioned this several times. We are moving our financial system and purchase order system over to eFinance at the beginning of January. Um, so just more as you know, keeping everybody. Uh, aligned that we will have some major impacts. Um, we're basically treating it like a year end. So we will have to close all purchase orders, get them out of an old system and into the new system um, at the beginning of January. So more of just kind of a, you know, just an announcement that, that we could see a lot of changes within uh, our, you know, just kind of financial reports and how we we're reporting on some things and um, just really kind of keeping an eye on that. We're in a good shape. The team has done a great job, um, put in a lot of very long hours to get this up and running. Uh, so we're ready. We're ready to be in that new system. So um, come January, we will, um, you know, hopefully be up and running. That is really all I have. Okay. All right. Thank you. That moves us into number seven, 7.1. 
A motion to adjourn to executive session in accordance with section 121.22 of the ORC to discuss a personnel matter in accordance with section 121.22 of the ORC item G1. Um, no action. Travel, no action will be taken. Need a motion to adjourn to executive session. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Pope? Yes. Mr. Kimmer? Yes. Mr. Myers? Yes. Motion is approved. <coughs> we are in executive session at 844.
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh? Ready? All right, we are back for executive session at 9.05. Moves us into number eight, closing items. 8.1 reminders, the next meeting will be Monday, December 7th, 7 o'clock at Rushville Middle School. And so that moves us into adjournment. Need a motion to adjourn. So moved. We want Mr. Myers. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Boat. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Good job on the Bye. Well, thank you. Have a good evening, everybody.